4.4 concavity and points of inflection. This is a continuation of the lesson that I did yesterday, which doesn't matter to you what day I did it on, I'm sure. But I wanted to um, to show you one little thing that I didn't mention that's um, part of one of the homework questions. I'll do that homework question and then I'm going to do another analysis for you from the homework assignment as well. So what I wanted to bring to your attention has to do with um, this graph here. It's more more visible in here. So when you do a second derivative, if you if you take a second derivative and you plug in some value of the original function into the second derivative and you get positive, it means that the graph is going to be concave up. If your second derivative for that value is negative, it's going to be concave down. So let's take a look at that on this example here that I did for you yesterday. So here's my second derivative here. Where is it positive? Well, obviously where it is above the x-axis. So here and here. And if we follow these lines up, that means I'm matching the second derivative with this part of the graph and this part of the graph. And you can see that these two parts of the original function are concave up. Okay, it's concave up and it's concave down in this little area between, I forget what these values were, but something like some root, root value. Okay, so you can see that's concave down here and that means it will be negative in if you plug that value into the second derivative. So in other words, if I put in zero here, so x is zero, x is zero into the second derivative, I will get negative eight, which means that it's in the zone where the function is concave down. And that implies that the tangents to the curve at that point of the original function will be above the graph. So that's the question that you're asked in um, question number four. And I'm going to do one example from that and then a complete analysis. Okay, so here's the question. It says determine the second derivative, the second derivative's value at the value indicated. State whether the curve lies above or below the tangent at this point. Okay, so here's my original function and I want to know when w is equal to three. So you have to be really good at taking your derivatives by now, right? So um, p prime at w. So this is why you needed to do a lot of practice back in, in chapter two to make sure you've got your, your derivatives nailed. Okay, so this should be written to the half power to start, right? I'm not going to write all that out. I'm just going to do it right as it is. So it's going to be the quotient rule. So I do ho d high, which is one, minus high d ho. The derivative of this is going to be one half w squared plus one to the minus one half times two w. I'm going to put these in brackets so you can see. So I did one half w squared plus one, reduced it by one, and took the derivative of the inside. So that's ho d high, I'll put the one here for you, minus high d ho all over ho squared. So let's put that in the denominator. So this squared is just going to be w squared plus one. You square radical, it's like the half power to the power of two, that means it's all to the power of one. Okay, so in order for you to um, simplify this, you need to do you need to do a little bit of fancy work here because I'm trying to subtract these two things. So let's write it out. Um, we'll write it back into radical form. So I have this. So I have w squared plus one minus. So what's in the denominator here and what's in the numerator? So be careful because you have a half times two. So the half is going to cancel it with this two. These w's are both in the numerator, right? Do you see that? So I have w and w. So this is w squared 
and this is in the denominator because it's to the negative exponent. So that's the square root of w squared plus 1. This is going to be a tough second derivative, isn't it? Well, it was a tough first one. So I have that and to so that I don't have something over something over something. I'm just going to write this over here as times w squared plus 1 over here. And that's quite a legitimate thing to do. It's just like if I had 4 up here divided by 2, I could say it's the same as 4 times 1 half, right? Okay, so in order for me to combine these two terms, because there's no way I can take the derivative of a second derivative with this mess, I need to find a common denominator. So my common denominator is going to be w squared plus 1. So I'm going to put that in a different color just so you see where it came from. So w squared plus 1. So the square root of w squared plus 1. So they have the same denominator. That means I have to multiply this by the same thing, right? That's the law. It's the law. Okay, so now... If I multiply these by each other, I just get w squared plus 1 minus w squared all over. And this is my denominator, right? The square root of w squared plus 1. And I'm still multiplying this by 1 over w squared plus 1. Okay, so I'm still simplifying this. This one cancels with this one. And I have 1 over this times 1 over this. Right? Times. This is bracket bracket here. So these cancel out. And I'm left with 1 times 1 is 1. And in the denominator, I have w squared plus 1. So this is to the half power. Let me just, I'm just going to kind of write over top of this. This is to the half power times this one, which is to the 2 over 2, or 1. If I multiply, that means I add the exponents, and I'm going to have w squared plus 1 to the 3 halves. Okay, so that's not so bad, right? When you're finished, let's put it with um, bringing it all to the numerator and make this to the negative, a negative exponent. Okay, so they're not asking me to find any critical values here, anything. It just wants to know whether the curve lies above or below the tangent. Oops, sorry. So if it's above or below the tangent, again, I want to know whether the function is concave up or concave down when w is 3. So I need the second derivative. I'm going to bring it back over here. So p prime w equals, so we have this. It's going to be easy to do the second derivative, much easier than the first, obviously. So p double prime at w is going to be minus 3 halves. So bring that to the front. Leave this alone. Reduce by 1 and times the derivative of the inside. Okay, so when I simplify that, these twos will cancel out. And I have minus 3w minus 3w over w squared plus 1 to the 5 halves. Okay, so make sure when you're doing these, you, you remember what belongs in the denominator and what's still in the numerator, right? So, so this stuff is all numerator here. This is numerator, this is numerator, and this is my de denominator. Right, that's my denominator because it has the negative exponent, not the number in front of it. And some people make that mistake of putting this minus 3 down there, which of course would not be correct. Okay, so now I have the second derivative and I want to know, is this number positive or negative? So I'm going to evaluate P double prime at 3. That was the question, it said what is p double prime at 3. So that gives me minus 9 in the numerator. And in the denominator, I would have 3 squared plus 1. So that's 10 to the 5 halves. So the square root of 10 raised to the fifth power is positive. So I have a negative over a positive. 
So this is going to be less than zero. P double prime at three is less than zero. So if it's less than the zero, that means, and I'll write that, therefore the function is concave down, concave down when w is equal to three. So it'll be something like this, right? So, and that means that the tangents, the tangent at this point will be this point, and you should be able to fill in the blanks for me, will be above, above, above the curve. Okay, so it means it's going to be like, if this was three here, it would be like, it's up here, right? The tangent is up here. You're under this concave down part of the function. Okay, so that was a little thing that uh, showed up in the homework assignment. Question number four. I don't know, maybe your teacher likes that question. Maybe they don't. And again, you know, teachers kind of choose what they can do <laughs> sometimes. And maybe sometimes just what they like to see or they think you should know how to do. That's kind of a little odd question. Okay, so 8b. Let me just bring up the question here to see what they asked you to do. 8b, I think it's a complete analysis, that's all. For each of the following functions, determine any points of inflection. Okay, use the results of part one along with the revised algorithm to sketch each function. Oh, okay, so they're really, they're asking you to do the whole shoot and match and sketch it in the end. Okay, so I'm going to go over this again in the next lesson, but let's think, what does this function here, before I take any derivatives, what can I learn from the function from this? Well, you can find the x-intercepts. Now, you might say, well, aren't they w-intercepts? Eh, maybe, but you're going to end up um, talking about them in terms of the x-intercepts because you're going to graph it on a coordinate plane. Okay, so let's say for x-intercept, that's the first thing you're going to do. Find your intercepts. For x-intercept, set g at w equal to 0. So I have 4w squared minus 3 equals 0. So 4w squared is equal to 3. w squared is equal to 3 halves. And w is equal to plus or minus square root of 3 halves. X-intercepts, done. Okay, so we want to also know what is the... Um, we want to know if we have any... Oh, let's do the y-intercept. For y-intercept, set w equal to 0. Oh no, oh no, w is not defined when it's 0. So this should say w is not equal to 0. That's part of the domain. Okay, no solution. Doesn't go there. Okay, so we've got our intercepts done. Now what else can we find out from this function? Well, we should be able to say what the um, vertical asymptote is, right? What's a vertical asymptote? Is what makes the denominator zero. So W is equal to three. Okay, what is the horizontal asymptote? So what happens as W gets really, really big here? So as this gets really, really big, this is the this divided by this really, really, really big number is going to be something really, really small. So the horizontal asymptote is um, y is equal to zero. Okay, so we have the vertical asymptote. Um, why did I say three here? I saw the cube. Sabra, wake up! I'm hungry can't think too well when you're hungry. So w equals 0 and y equals 0. Vertical, horizontal. So I've got those two things now and I'm going to go on to do the um, uh, critical values. So we're going to take the first and second derivatives so we get those out of the way. And this is an easy one to take the derivative of if you simplify it first. If you ever have a function that just has 
one term in the denominator, like, like this, right? It's just this variable. Let's divide each of these and it will make the equation much easier to deal with. <clears throat> so 4w squared divided by w cubed is 4w to the negative 1 minus 3w to the negative 3. Isn't that much easier to look at? You don't have to use quotient rule. It's very simple. Okay, let's go ahead and do the derivative. g prime at w equals minus 4 over w squared. Can you do that on one step? Of course you can. This became negative 2 in the denominator, makes it positive. Minus 3 times minus 3, that's going to be plus 9. Reduce this by 1, it's going to give me w to the fourth power. Okay, so in order for me to add these together, I have to have a common denominator. So that's going to be w to the fourth. And just to remind you, that means we have to multiply this by w squared and this by w squared. Whatever you do to the denominator, you have to do to the numerator. So that's kind of nice because then I have a nice little equation up here. 4w squared plus 9. There's my first derivative. Now we could go ahead and do the um, first derivative test. Or we could find the second derivative and use a second derivative test. Your choice. Now, maybe your teacher, you can ask if they're going to give you um, an outline. Like sometimes they'll say, you know, find find all asymptotes, find all intercepts, which will have, to, you know, will twig your memory that what you have to do here. But I think you should start understanding what you need to do when you have an original function. What will that give you? What will the first derivative give you? What will the second derivative give you? Okay, so let's do um, let's do a first derivative test, and uh, we'll also do um, the second derivative test once we take the second derivative, and you can see that I give you the same answer. Okay, so first we need to say for critical values, set g prime at w equal to zero. And again, we look to the numerator because we don't want this to be zero anyway. So we get 4w squared is equal to 9. And that means w is going to be equal to 9 divided by 4. And the square root of that is going to be plus or minus 3 halves. Okay, so if we do a first derivative test on this now, we're going to need to make a number line. So let's do... Do a little number line here like this. I'm going to label it g prime at w. I hope your teacher lets you do this because it's just otherwise it's so time consuming. It's the same work, it's just much easier. Okay, now we also have to watch out for the other critical value, which is w equals zero. So I'm going to put a little asymptote line here. So you know that's zero. So that means you can't just say what's between here and here. You have to check between this to here and this to here. Okay, so here's your intervals. If you're making a table, you do minus infinity to minus three halves, minus three halves to zero, zero to three halves, and three halves to infinity, right? And you would write out minus four w squared plus nine and w to the fourth and figure out the sign of each of those and multiply them together to get your solution. But let's be smart about this. Let's say minus 3 halves, let's go to minus 2. I put in minus 2 into this equation, so that's my g prime w. I'm going to put in minus 2, minus 2 squared. That's um, 4, minus 4. So 4 times minus 4 is negative 16, plus 9 is minus 7. This is going to be positive, so that means in here, Let's get some nice pretty color. It's going to be negative. And I tested the point minus 2. Between minus 3 halves and 0, I choose minus 1. Minus 1 squared is 1 times minus 4 is minus 4 plus 9 is 5. This is positive. Positive here. That's looking good, right? Now on the other side of the asymptote, okay, remember you cannot cross a vertical asymptote. It's like a big barrier wall. Trump's wall right there. That might date me in a few years, hopefully. So between 0 and 3 halves, let's try positive 1. It's going to be the very same as we got on this side because I'm squaring 1, multiplying it by a negative, adding 9. So that's positive, again positive. 
And on the other side, because we're squaring and fourth power, like if these were odd, odd exponents, you'd get different solutions. But a positive 2 here is going to give me the same result as a negative 2. I'm sure you see that. Okay, so there we go. So this means I have a minimum, minimum at minus 3 halves and something and maximum at 3 halves and something. Where do I get these values for the somethings? Hopefully you know really well where that is. That comes from the original function. Any point, I can't overemphasize this because I've seen so many people do this wrong and wonder why they weren't getting the right answer. You have to plug it back into this function. And I'm just going to tell you what the answer is to save time here because this gets very long if I do every calculation. So I get minus 48 over 27 and positive 48 over 27. Okay, so let's go ahead now and do the second derivative. So you know how to get this number, right? We'll just move on. So let's do g double prime at w. So here's my equation. I'm going to simple simplify, before I start, I'm going to simplify the first derivative so it's easier to work with. So g prime at w, this is minus 4 w to the minus 2 plus 9 w to the minus 4. Okay, hopefully you can see how I get that. It's just a matter of bringing your um, this denominator up here beside each of these. So I'm dividing by each of these. Okay, let's do the second derivative. It's going to be easy now because we simplified it. That's going to be 8 w's to the minus 3 or positive 3 here plus, oh sorry, minus 9 times minus 4 is minus 36 minus 36 over w to the power of 5. Okay, so in order to have the same common denominator, I need to multiply and get w to the 5 down here. So I want w squared, w squared, and that's going to give me another nice little equation here. So I have 8w squared minus 36 um, over w to the power of 5. And for all these, w is not equal to 0. We have to say that maybe. Depends on your teacher. Some people are really strict about making sure you state restrictions every time. Okay, so here we go. We've got all this set up. And I could have also taken um, a second derivative test to see if it was a minimum or a maximum, right? Um, let's leave that for now because we're going to use this to find, what does the second derivative give you? Points of inflection, right? Okay, so for points of inflection, set g double prime w equal to 0. And again, we have this lovely little equation in the top. So I have 8w squared is equal to 36. w squared is equal to 36 divided by 8. Mm -mm -mm. 36 over 8, can we reduce that? Sure we can. They both divide by 4. That gives us 9 over 2. So w equals plus or minus. The square root of 9 is 3. So I have 3 over square root 2. Plus or minus. Don't forget. Okay, so now let's do a second derivative test for concavity. Because the question is going to say, find the points of inflection and prove, prove, that you have a change in concavity or state the intervals of concavity. So I'm going to, I'll do it right here. Let's do our second derivative, g double prime w. And this time I still have this asymptote here, the vertical asymptote is zero. And I have minus root, minus three over root two. And I have 3 over root 2. So let's pick some numbers to check the concavity. So minus 1, obviously, would be a good one. And here's my derivative here, my second derivative. 
negative 1, so you square that, you get 8 minus 36 is negative. A negative over negative 1 to the fifth is a negative. Negative divided by a negative is a positive. So it's positive in here. That means concave up, right? Positive is concave up. And if I go on this side, you're going to see a difference this time because we have the fifth power. So the numerator is still going to give us the same answer because I put in 1. That gives me 8 minus 36 is negative, but I'm dividing by a positive. So that's going to be concave down in here. To the other side of 3 over root 2, 3 over root 2 is about uh, just over 2, so let's try 3. If I put in 3, that would give me 72 minus 36 is positive over a positive. That's positive. That's concave up. And on the other side, if I put in negative 3, uh, again, this is going to be positive. So 72 minus 36 is positive. And I'm putting in a negative here to a fifth power, so that's going to give me a negative value. So positive divided by negative gives me negative. Okay, so these are going to be points of inflection, and you can make that statement right now. So therefore, points of inflection at, and you're going to do minus 3 over root 2, and this, and remember where you're finding these. Um, you're going to plug 3 over root 2 and minus 3 over root 2 into the original function to get your answer, and it happens to be whoop, 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 10 root 2 over 9. 10 root 2 over 9. And for the negative 1, that's a negative 1. And 3 over root 2 gives you 10 root 2 over 9, positive. Okay, so I've done all of this work. Now what do I need to state? You still need to state the intervals of increase and decrease. You still have to sketch it. So let's do the intervals first. And I'm going to write them right. So here, this is where you read your intervals of increase, right? Intervals of increase. R. Where is it positive? You read it right off here. You don't have to go any farther. Don't try to make it difficult. Where is it positive? That's an interval of increase. So I have minus 3 halves and round brackets, right? Because we're not including those points. Minus 3 halves to 0. Union 0 to 3 halves. So that's my interval of increase and my intervals of decrease. Okay, remember, all you have to do is look to your, um, your slope curves here. Where is it decreasing? Oh, here and here. So that's negative infinity to minus 3 halves and decreasing from 3 halves to infinity. And there's my intervals. Easy. Where are my intervals of concavity? So let's put a different color just because it makes it really look pretty. Okay, intervals of concavity. You read it right off this little chart here. So I'm going to say increasing. Oh, no, I don't want to say increase. I want to say concave, concave up. On this interval. So where is it concave up? Well, wherever it's positive. So that's minus 3 over root 2, minus 3 over root 2 to 0, and concave up here. This is so easy, right? It really is. And once you get into the groove, okay, now I want to know where is it concave down. And so concave down, I've got here negative infinity to minus 3 over root 2. And I've concave down between 0 and 3 over root 2. And there you go. You've done all your intervals of concavity and your intervals of increase and decrease. 
and you've got everything you need in order to sketch the graph. Uh, let me just get a piece of graph paper. I was going to put it on the other side, but then you won't be able to see what we did. Okay, I'm just going to use this paper here so I don't waste time here. Okay, so we need to we need to put this on a grid now. Oh, sorry, not organized. Okay, let's make a little coordinate plane here, and we have um, x intercepts, y intercepts. So take a look at it. Make sure before you start doing a graph that you know how far you have to go up and down. Right? This is this is kind of critical. Okay, so minus 48 over 27, ooh, 48 over 27, that is about, I think I did that somewhere, minus 1.8, so this is about minus 1.8, and of course this would be 1.8, 10 root 2 is about minus 1.57, and minus 3 over root 2 is about minus 2.1, okay, so we're dealing with numbers between sort of one and three. We don't need to make a big scale here. So I'm going to put one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. Okay, we want to get all these points on the graph. So my x-intercept, x-intercept was Hope you have this written down somewhere. Um, we had plus or minus root 3 over 2. So root 3 over 2 is right about, let's say here and here. We have a maximum value. Our maximum value was at 3 halves. That's 1 and a half and 1.8. So it's about here. And we have an asymptote of x equals 0. Make sure that um, you label things nicely so your teacher knows where you got these numbers from. Right? You want to put everything on the graph. Root 3 over 2 minus root 3 over 2. And the maximum here was 3 halves and minus 48 over 27. That's a maximum value. So we have a graph that's coming up like this, has a maximum here, and where's our point of inflection? Ooh, that's the other thing we got to put in, right? So point of inflection at 3 over root 2. So 3 divided by root 2. What's 3 divided by root 2? Ugh. 3 divided by second function square root 2 is 2.12. Okay, so that's 2.12, and the height was one and a half. So that's right about here. So the graph comes down like this. You have to show that you've changed direction there, right? So you want it to look like it was concave down on that side of the function, and then it's concave up here to show your concavity. And this function is quite symmetrical. It has the same... Um, same shape on the other side, only kind of upside down, right? So we're going to go to a minimum value of minus 3 halves and minus 1.8. So about here again. And we have a point of inflection just past it, just like that one. So it approaches our horizontal asymptote, changing concavity, and it shapes up this way. Okay, so we also have to mark on here our horizontal asymptote. And again, you can see that it did cross the horizontal asymptote for finite values of x. So this is y equals 0, x equals 0, and there's your graph. So hopefully um, that all helps. There is another one in very similar to this question in the next chapter. Uh, not chapter, but in 4.5 for complete analysis. So you can use this as kind of a guide. It's almost the same question. It just has little different numbers, but it is a difference of only one degree, numerator and denominator. Okay, that was like way too long. Hopefully you followed along. And again, um, 
please subscribe. Tell all your friends. The more people that come to the channel, the more people I can help and the happier it makes me. Bye for now.